Welcome everyone to the Great Mind series. We are honored to have Professor Hyman Shepper with us. Professor Shepper is not only a distinguished neurologist at Montreal Jewish General Hospital, but also serves as a professor of neurology and medicines at the McGill University in Canada. With over 200 peer-reviewed papers, his research expertise lies in the field of degenerative brain disease. But what makes his work truly fascinating is his explorations of the intersections between contemporary science and Kabbalistic mysticism. He has made a significant contribution to his unique discourse through his writing in journals such as Torah Yumada, Unified Theory Mechanics II, and Dad, Journal of Jewish Philosophy and Kabbalah. Currently, he is leading his expertise in the Essential Foundation as a member of the Academy Advisory Board. Today, we delve into his work on Kabbalistic panpsychism. Welcome, Professor Schiffer. Thank Ivy uh, for this kind invitation to allow me to, to share some of my interests uh, with this audience. So the topic that I'm going to cover uh, is that of Kabbalistic panpsychism. As Many people know today um, consciousness is probably one of the most enigmatic uh, areas of, of human endeavor, be it philosophical or scientific or theological. We really don't have a good handle on what this is. Um, the Oxford Dictionary, for example, will define consciousness as the state of being aware of and responsive to one's surroundings or the fact of awareness uh, by the mind of itself in the world. Uh, I somehow enjoy uh, the uh, whimsical definition once published in the Montreal Gazette that consciousness are those annoying periods between naps. Uh, consciousness over the um, ages uh, has been largely divided into dualistic and monistic uh, um, perspectives. Dualism is the notion that there is uh, spirit and there is physicality, very uh, disparate entities, uh, as uh, promoted by, for example, uh, René Descartes. Monism is the concept that um, all of reality has both a spiritual and a physical side. There's one substance that has both physical and um, uh, spiritual properties. Reductionism, which is the prevailing view in science today and for the last 150, 200 years, uh, uh, indicates or uh, promulgates that existence will boil down to matter, energy, time, and space. That's it. There is no spirit. And epi, uh, looking at uh, consciousness, would be viewed more as an epiphenomenon than a, uh, a, a force that can impact uh, the physical world. There are, uh, however, uh, challenges to dualism. Uh, and the main challenge is uh, how does matter and spirit interact? If they're completely separate domains, how do they relate to each other? But there's also a very important challenge to reductionist monism. And that is, how does matter give rise to qualia, feelings, subjective experience? Why do electrical discharges in your temporal lobe elicit a symphony, whereas very similar electrochemical changes in your occipital lobe uh, is uh, our experience visually. Why is that? Um, this has puzzled scientists to the extent where uh, typical um, materialistic understanding of consciousness is being now seen to be inadequate to explain the phenomenon. In fact, uh, neuroscientists like Christoph Koch, uh, who was an ardent physicalist to begin with, uh, has flipped to the other side and has, and I quote here, he writes, consciousness does not appear in the equations that make up the foundations of physics, nor in chemistry's periodic table, nor in the endless molecular sequences of our genes. 
And this has led to David Chalmers coining the term, the hard problem of consciousness. The easy problem is, which isn't very easy, is trying to see the neural correlates of consciousness. And there's a huge amount of neuroscientific inquiry in that area. But the hard problem is how do electrical discharges, physical behavior of, of neurons uh, interacting lead to qualia, feelings? Uh, uh, why does pain hurt? Nobody seems to have a good answer to that question, at least not from a reductionist point of view. Which then led to individuals in the last 20 years starting to reconsider uh, the notion of panpsychism. Panpsychism, as the name implies, uh, suggests that consciousness or mind is a ubiquitous feature of all things in creation, regardless of size, scale, or complexity. So it is as primary as space, time, matter, and energy. If this is true, this would immediately resolve Chalmers' heart problem because we no longer need to ask how does physical um, atoms and electrons and quarks give rise to consciousness when consciousness is in the creation from the, uh, from the outset. Uh, that would resolve the problem. But then panpsychism uh, leads to another uh, difficulty, which um, has been referred to as the combination problem. Combination problem uh, is the, uh, the concern as to how primitive consciousness that may inhere, let's say, in atoms, uh, in molecules, how do the primitive consciousnesses combine within life forms, especially humans, to generate uh, very complex levels of consciousness that uh, we experience. And as I will try to explain, uh, the, uh, the Kabbalistic understanding of consciousness will render this combination problem moot. So what is the Kabbalah? The Kabbalah, um, <clears throat> it derives from the Hebrew root kabel, which means to receive. Our tradition tells us that when Moses was standing on Mount Sinai to receive the Torah, the Torah came in, 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 uh, uh, in two different manifestations. There was a written Torah, which we're all familiar with as the Bible, the five books of Moses. But there was also an oral Torah that was transmitted to Moses from God and from Moses then to, um, to the, the nation of Israel. And this oral Torah was passed on ubiquitously throughout society until around the second and third centuries, where uh, the ability to transmit it orally was uh, curtailed, and therefore it had to be written down. And that's what we study as the Talmud. Still, even though it's written, it's still referred to as the oral tradition. Within this oral tradition, Moses also received an esoteric aspect of the Torah, which is the Kabbalah, which was uh, then disseminated not throughout all of the nation of Israel, but to very, very select disciples. And each disciple would then uh, uh, pass the information to uh, a few individuals uh, under their mentorship throughout the ages. So this information although present in every generation, was still uh, mainly kept below the radar of uh, general Torah scholarship, with the exception of certain periods where uh, the esoteric aspects of the Torah were um, uh, sort of ex expanded within the mainstream domain, such as in the second century with the work of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, in the 16th century with the mystics of the Israeli city of Safed, uh, the birth of Hasidism brought a lot of Kabbalistic understanding into the world beginning in the 18th century. And we're anticipating that within the next 220 years or so, with the advent of the seventh or messianic millennium, there will be a tremendous outpouring of Kabbalistic truths. And in my opinion, we're already beginning to see uh, uh, the beginning of, of this process.
Before ex explaining how the Kabbalah construes consciousness, it's important to uh, place uh, the Jewish perspective and to a large extent the Christian perspective uh, of theology in its proper framework. And this is illustrated in this slide where on the left, we have a system whereby God, the deity, creates a universe and lets the universe run along the laws of physics, occasionally intervening with the odd miracle. And this is referred to as theism. If in this scenario, God were to completely leave the scene and the universe would function 100% autonomously, that would be called deism. And theism, uh, deism are not uh, uh, compatible with the uh, Kabbalistic understanding uh, of reality. Another possible way of uh, looking at theology is that God is completely imminent within the universe that he created. And that's referred to as pantheism, such as that promulgated by Baruch Spinoza in the uh, 17th century. And pantheism suggests that if you were to understand the creation 100% fully, that you would know everything there is to know about God. And this view is an anathema to Jewish thinking. The, um, uh, the most authentic way uh, Judaism and I believe Christianity uh, construes theology is shown here on the right. And this is referred to as panentheism. And panentheism is really a combination of theism and pantheism, whereby there are aspects of God that are truly imminent within the created universe, as in the case of pantheism, but there's also a uh, perhaps a uh, larger uh, component of the deity that is transcendent of the creation, as in theism. And that is the uh, authentic way the Kabbalah looks at theology. What's amazing are some of the innovations in science since the 20th century that allows science to have a much more meaningful conversation with Jewish mysticism. Uh, and this is sort of metaphorically illustrated in this slide, whereas before the 20th century, you had the revealed Torah, which is the Talmud that we all study, and beneath the Torah, hidden away, was the Kabbalah. At the same time, before the 20th century, you had Newtonian physics, which didn't seem to relate in any direct, meaningful way to the revealed Torah. But since the 20th century, with the advent of quantum mechanics and relativity, shown here as these roots, there is now a tremendous dialogue possible between Jewish theology through the Kabbalah and science through the contemporary physics of quantum mechanics and relativity. And to me, this is a very exciting uh, development, uh, which is uh, a harbinger of things to come within the next 200, 220 years. A very basic concept, the most fundamental, I would say, in the Kabbalah, is that everything, every object and every event it comprises what are called sefirot. Uh, and there are 10 of them. And they're illustrated here. And a sefira, in singular, can be defined as a divine force, an energy, or a power, or an attribute of God, or some refer to as an information packet. What's important to note is that each sefira is made of two components, light and a vessel that holds the light. The light is the light of what's called Ein Sof, which in Hebrew means infinite. This is the light of God. And it is completely undifferentiated. Uh, and it enters in an undifferentiated state into each sefira. And it's the vessel of the sefira that gives uh, to the light color or texture, shape, 
properties. And on the right here is shown the typical flow of divine influence from the unified Ein Sof down into whatever structure was uh, created uh, to illustrate these powers. So you have, for example, the power going from Ein Sof into the first Sephira, Keter. And Keter is different than the other nine in that it's the transcendent aspect of any decasephirotic system you're discussing. From Keter, it goes into the first of the imminent Sephirot, which is called Chochmah. And then Chochmah to Bina, Chesed, Vurat, Tiferet, Netzach, Yisod. Finally, reaching the 10th Sephira, which is called Malchut. Malchut is the divine feminine, and it is a transducer that converts the initial thoughts in the minds of God, let's say, into a product. That is the purpose of the final Sephira Malchut. In order to appreciate how things came into being, I'd like to go through this slide, which shows the creation, but not the creation most of you are familiar with in uh in the Bible. This is what um, the Kabbalah uh, understands as the creation pre-Genesis 1-1. And I put pre here in quotation marks because in the system I'm going to describe, time has not yet been created. According to the Kabbalah, time and space are creations. Not that God decided in a, at a given time to create. No, when he decided to create, one of the creations he created was time. So this is uh, but we need to speak in a sequential fashion or else we wouldn't be able to convey any information to each other. So we'll talk as if there's a temporal sequence. It starts off here in, in panel A as the undifferentiated uh, Ein Sof, the undifferentiated light of God. That's all there is. God, when he decided to create a universe, he withdrew his light from a central point and that is the process which is referred to in Lurianic Kabbalah as symptom contraction. And this produced a void shown here in black. And this, in this void, the entire cosmos will be created. Now, you notice here, there's this uh, red ring within the void. This is a small uh, veneer of holiness that was left within the void after the Ein Sof, the light of God withdrew from this central point. In panel D, we see that from the transcendent aspect of God, a line of holiness, if you will, penetrated into the void to combine with this reshimu or this red uh, residual light that was left after the contraction. You can see from panel D why we refer to uh, Judaism and Kabbalah and Christianity as panentheistic, because you have the transcendent light of God present, but you also now have an imminent light, which is called a kav, that enters into the creation. And when the kav, this ray of light, combines with the Rishimu, this is what generates the 10 sefirot with Keter, the most sublime of them, at the interface between imminence and transcendence here, and the lowest of the Sephirot, the innermost circle here, uh, being Malchut. Now, this concentric configuration is the way God uses his powers to run the universe, to run the creation. But at the same time, there's a concomitant rearrangement of this concentric design into what's called in Hebrew, surat adam, the shape of man, the shape of man. So now the 10 sefirot are uh, showing a right side, a left side, a top, a bottom, and a central core, similar to uh, the shape of man. And this is what creates the very first of five worlds, the highest world, called Adam Kadmon. And Adam Kadmon translates as primordial man because the Sfirot are now in the shape of man. What's important to understand is that the Tzimtzum, this contraction process, is iterative and recursive. And there is a Tzimtzum in Adam Kadmon, 
which then leads to new transcendent light coming in, generating the next lower world. This is the world of Atsilut. And this process continues from one world to another. You can picture these worlds as dimensions, with Adam Kadmon being the deepest, most sublime dimension, going to Atsilut, and then the process to Bria, Yitzira, Asiya. Asiya is the world of action. This is the world we live in, because the bottom of the world of Asiya is what generates the physical cosmos. What this means is that everything above Malchut of Asiya, and certainly these higher worlds leading up to Adam Kadmon, are all spiritual entities, although each of them have their own unique properties, with Adam Kadmon being the most sublime. Another aspect that is relevant uh, to what we're going to speak soon about consciousness is that each of these worlds dresses on top of and is superficial to the bottom half of the progenitor world. So Atsilut will dress like clothing, like a glove on a hand, on top of the bottom of Adam Kadmon. Bria will do it on the bottom of Atsilut, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And Asiya will do it on, uh, on Yitzira. This is very similar to the notion um, developed by the 20th century physicist David Bohm, referred to as the implicate and explicate order, for those of you who are familiar with uh, Bohmian mechanics and philosophy. Bohm suggested that what we experience is just the most superficial aspect of reality what he called the explicate order. This would be what we see when we look out the window uh, at our universe or when we look through a microscope. It's what uh, the explicate order or the bottom world of Asiya is what is amenable to our senses and our instrumentation. But David Bohm realized that below the explicate order is the first layer of implicate order and then a deeper layer and a deeper layer leading to what's called the hollow movement, which is an absolute unified field. It's like a quantum potential uh, and is similar to the Kabbalistic understanding of the undifferentiated light of God or the Ein Sof. So this is a metaphor, which I like to use to explain some of this, uh, this, this concept of enclothement, where one world is enclothing another world, uh, like Russian dolls, uh, and one sphera can be said to enclose the sphera above it in the same fashion. And in Hebrew, it's hitlap shoot. And it's very, very similar to uh, the Bohmian concept of the implicate and explicate order. So, for example, if you have the Ein Sof here at the top, the undifferentiated light of God, and you have here the creation as an inverted telescope uh, with, it happens to have five uh, rungs. Let's say the top rung is Adam Kadmon, then uh, the next world, Atsilut, and Bria, Yetzirah, and finally Asiya. And we're down here uh, at the very bottom of the creation in the physical world. And you can see how each rung overlaps the rung above it. And this is the idea of the explicate order of Bohm uh, surrounding uh, layers of the implicate order. Same idea. And what it also shows are these joints. And these it's at the joints where influence from God, from higher uh, strata, such as Adam Kadmon, will filter into a lower world, like Atsilut and then Bria, et cetera, et cetera. It happens through these, these joints. Now, this is a highly dynamical system. And in times when there's a lot of evil in the world, or evil within an individual person's soul. This is tantamount to a stretching of this telescope, if you will, further away from the Ein Sof. So now we're down here much further uh, from the uh, undifferentiated light of God than we were when there was goodness in the world. And there's also less overlap between the worlds, thereby um, preventing the, uh, the flow of divine influence, goodness, into the creation. Conversely, when we do good deeds, 
which in, uh, in Judaism are referred to as mitzvot, uh, good deeds or rectifications, uh, we are actually repairing deficiencies where, which allow the telescope in this metaphor to contract back up towards the undifferentiated Ein Sof, revealing a much higher degree of unity and there's far more overlap between each world, allowing much greater uh, beneficial influence to flow from on high into, into the creation. So how does this work in terms of uh, the, the creation? How does uh, consciousness operate? And how does consciousness relate to the unconscious aspects of the, of the creation? Another way of asking this question is, how does God govern the world and all of its manifestations? Because everything is made up of, as I said, 10 sefirot, of which the top three, either Keter, Chochmah, or Bina, or in some frames of reference, uh, Chochmah, Bina, and Dat, the top three are conscious. They're referred to in Hebrew as Mochin. Mochin means brains. And since everything, and this is the, the key here, since everything is comprised of ten sefirot, everything has consciousness, hence panpsychism. So the top three are conscious, and the bottom seven are bodily or unconscious sefirot. So how do things operate? Um, the way to uh, one way to explain this is to use an analogy of, uh, in this case, of a woman who has the sudden desire to live in a house. Of course, the, basically, the, uh, uh, this is trying to uh, be an analogy for God having a desire to create a cosmos. But it's easier to understand with this, with this analogy. So the desire, which is in Hebrew, ratzon, to build a house, this desire is manifest in the transcendent sphera of Keter. The next stage is an image pops into her mind of the kind of house she wants, a cottage or a duplex. This happens in the second sephira of Chochmah. Cosmologically, Chochmah is the singularity which gave rise to the Big Bang. Everything is contained in Chochmah, except it's not manifest yet. It's completely undifferentiated, but it exists as opposed to Keter, which is transcendent. So she has this all of a sudden, a eureka moment. Ah, she wants a cottage, let's say. In order to uh, implement her desire, she now needs to uh, develop architectural plans in order to uh, allow her to build the cottage she wants. So it, the plans will include the design of the cottage, dimensions, which materials she'll use, et cetera, et cetera. This happens in the next sphera, Bina, which uh, is still part of the consciousness system of every decasephorotic uh, assembly. This is the consciousness that takes place in everything that is created. Okay, she now has her architectural plans. She now wants to get down to the business of actually building the house. So she hires a construction company. And in this analogy, the construction company refers to the next six sefirot, which are chesed, vura, tiferet, netzach, on yesod, which act in unison to actually physically construct the house. When she knocks in the last nail in the house, thereby completing the house, this is the act of malchut, which I mentioned is the tenth sefirah that leads to a final product. And in building the house, she now satiates her initial desire, which was in the transcendent sephira of Keter. And this establishes a vital axis, which um, is referred to in the Kabbalah as the Keter Malchut axis. And it'll become very important a little bit later as I uh, describe some of the workings of consciousness. Okay, she now has a house and she lives in it. And she's happy because it conforms to her initial uh, desire. But now she starts saying, okay, well, let's start thinking about what kind of a living room I want. This starts the whole process over again. 
sort of as a fractal of the initial design. So now we're dealing with a mini Keter, which then will activate in sequence the nine lower sephirot, which are important for her to furnish a living room according to her desire. So this and many, many other sub Keters are nested hierarchically within the overarching Keter prime uh, for her to own a house of her liking. And this is, uh, again, an analogy for how God creates the world in stages, going from uh, a more general creation into more and more highly specific details down to the very bottom of creation, which is the physical universe. Another interesting concept that is uh, uh, fundamental to the Kabbalah is referred to in uh, Hebrew as hit kalalut, or in English, interinclusion. It is a mind-bending concept that suggests that the entire creation is recapitulated within every one of its parts, as shown here in this diagram, where the universe is made of 10 sefirot, but each sefirah contains 10 sefirah. And if you look inside each mini sefirah, it'll have a mini, mini sefirah. And this is a fractal design, which uh, is uh, uh, used to create the universe uh, that we live in. What's remarkable is there are physical correlates of this interinclusion concept. And this is very clearly illustrated by the discovery of uh, laser holog or holography by Dennis Gabor in the mid 20th century. And what it shows is the following. Let's say you took a regular photograph. Let's say a photograph of the globe of the earth, regular photograph. And you were to cut out the upper right segment of that photograph and look at what you see in the segment, perhaps, what you might see is, in this analogy, Siberia. You wouldn't see, of course, the rest of the world. But if you took a holographic plate, due to the laws of physics and the, and, and the quantum mechanics of light, if you were to cut out this right upper segment of a holographic plate and shine a laser through it, you wouldn't just see Siberia. You would see the entire globe except in miniature, because all of the information of the globe is contained within every point of light within this holographic plate. It's remarkable. And what's even more remarkable is that uh, uh, the physicist David Bohm has provided us with mathematics to suggest that there may be a holographic design uh, 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 undergirding the entire cosmos, and there's now some physical evidence that that is in fact true based on an analysis of the surface of uh, black holes. And I've actually published several papers, both in English and in Hebrew, uh, showing the conflation of Bohmian mechanics and the Kabbalah, which are absolutely astounding. Where Bohm talks about a hollow movement, the Kabbalah for millennia has used the term or ein sof, the light of the infinite. Where Bohm talks about an implicate order, the Kabbalah talks about enclosement or hitlapshut. And where Bohm uh, suggests that the design of the universe is holographic, the Kabbalah understood this as interinclusion. Another concept, um, equally astounding, perhaps in some ways even more so, is the idea of hit kashrut, which means interpenetration. I showed you that there's a natural flow of influence from the top of a world to the bottom, let's say from Keter of Bria, the world Bria, down to Malchut. Malchut will then feed into the Keter of the next world as a sort of a domino effect, finally leading to a product in the physical world at the bottom of the world of Asiya shown here. But at the same time, concomitant with the serial flow of divine influence, there is a um, cross-cutting mode whereby 
the deity, God, is able to activate, let's say, one sefira, let's say in this example shown in gray here, uh, chesed, loving kindness, throughout the entire inf uh, fractal infrastructure of the cosmos at the same time. This is a far more greater um, uh, uh, example of the underlying unity of the creation. We don't tend to see things this way. We see things in a more hierarchical domino effect like uh, uh, sort of manner, but at the same time, there is this uh, cross-cutting or parallel processing going on throughout the cosmos below the radar of our, of our senses and instruments. What's remarkable is that this is highly reminiscent of the quantum mechanical concept of entanglement for which the Nobel Prize was given in 2022. Entanglement works as follows. If you have a progenitor particle and it splits into two particles, let's say photons, photon A and a sister particle B, it is known by quantum mechanics that if photon A has a property called spin up, then photon B has to have an anti-correlated spin down. And this relationship, this anti-correlation is maintained regardless of how far apart these particles move in the universe. They can go to opposite ends of the universe. And it has been shown experimentally that if you can manipulate one of the sister particles, converting, let's say, this particle A from spin up to spin down, automatically, instantaneously, the sister particle will go from spin down to spin up, regardless of how far they're separated. They could be separated by light years. This was very problematic to Albert Einstein, who felt that this contradicts the special theory of relativity. Um, because it would suggest that information is traveling from particle A to B uh, at superluminal speeds. David Bohm and other physicists have shown, uh, and it's now, as I say, been verified, that this, is a, uh, this interpretation of Einstein's is incorrect. A better in interpretation is that of Bohm, who says that in the implicate order, the order we cannot see, because these two particles emanated from a single progenitor particle, in the implicate order, they're really part and parcel of the same thing. They look separate in the explicate order, but in reality, they're unified. But you have to look deeper, and we don't have yet the instruments to do it, although we have the mathematics to suggest it. And therefore, no information has to travel from A to B at faster than the speed of light. These uh, are really part and parcel of the same particle. And what it means is like, just like I'm separate from my neighbor and my computer is separate from my desk and my desk from my bottle of, mi of uh, mineral water, this is only true in the explicate order. This is true in the oil of Asiya, the world of Asiya. When you go into higher realms, deeper dimensions, there's more and more unifications until you reach the top world, which in Kabbalah is Adam Kadmon, where all you see is basically uh, unification. Kabbalistic panpsychism um, suggests that all things created, be they animate or inanimate, are made of ten sefirot, of which the top three are conscious and the bottom seven are bodily. According to the Kabbalah, consciousness is not the product of, it's not secreted by, it's not emergent within or the exclusive domain of neural tissue. Contrary to the reductionist perspective, the prevailing perspective, consciousness is not an epiphenomenon that's bereft of causal action within the physical world. In fact, consciousness is primordial too. It transcends. It's also imminent within and impacts all aspects of reality, both spiritual and physical. This slide, uh, again, uh, uh, emphasizes that the top three sefirot are conscious, 
and the bottom are unconscious. And the arrangement, as I tried to show you, is hierarchical, it's holographic, and as I'll now illustrate, it's also relativistic in an Einsteinian sense. In order to um, uh, make this point, uh, I, I should say that all of creation is understood by the Kabbalah to be divided into four categories, four domains. The first domain is called domen, which in Hebrew means inanimate objects. Yes, it's made of ten sefirot. The top three are conscious, but consciousness in a rock, for example, all it does is it informs form and substance. There's obviously no sentience. <laughs> the next level up is referred to as tzomeach, which is plant life. It also has three conscious sefirot, but now consciousness informs growth and reproduction, which are denied to the inanimate domain. Moving up further, we go to the level of chai, which means animal life, which now consciousness expresses sentience and emotions, typical of the animal kingdom. And finally, you move up to midaber, which in Hebrew means speaker, which refers to human beings, which have all of the above characteristics, but in addition now can express new consciousness through the higher sefirot of the human being, uh, which are self-awareness, morality, ethics, and rationality. This next slide is the, um, the slide around which the entire talk pivots. Um, and um, it explains, I think, the, uh, the, under the relativistic understanding of, of consciousness uh, as per the Kabbalah. In this square, the white represents consciousness space. On the left, is the transcendent aspects of consciousness. On the right is the imminent phase of consciousness in accord with the tenets of panentheism. There's a transcendent phase and an imminent phase. In the case of domain, which is, let's say, minerals, a rock, the rock is made of ten sefirot, like everything else, of which the top three, GR are Hebrew for top three, that's all it means, the top three are able to filter from the transcendent phase of consciousness a minute bubble of imminent consciousness, enough to give the rock form and substance. That's what consciousness means to a rock in a panpsychist perspective. Moving up to the next stage of plant life, the plants also have ten sefirot, like everything else. Plants also have minerals. But when a mineral is within a plant, the 10 sefirot of the mineral are compactified within the seven bodily unconscious sefirot of the plant. As the plant now expresses new level consciousness through its top three sefirot, which now allow for growth and reproduction, which the rock did not have. Moving forward from the uh, plant life to animal life, same thing happens. The animal is made of 10 sefirot. It has growth and reproduction, of course, which are plant life. But now the 10 sefirot of plant behavior is compactified within the seven unconscious bodily sefirot of the animal, as the animal now can filter much more transcendent light into the imminent phase, giving the animal characteristics such as emotions not seen in plants, and certainly not in inanimate objects. Upgrading to humans, same situation. The 10 sefirot of the animal are compactified within the human being, because after all, we do have emotions like animals necessary for our survival. But the human brain is now able to filter much more consciousness from the transcendent domain into the imminent domain. And it is our belief that this will expand tremendously uh, as we encroach on 
this seventh or messianic millennium. The, this is the last real um, conceptual slide I'd like to share with you. Um, uh, it, it deals with a unique structure within the Sephira of Keter, which in Aramaic language is referred to as Resha de la Siada or unknowable head. And I'm uh, going to suggest that the workings of this unknowable head or Radla, as it's the acronym in Hebrew is Radla, is remarkably similar to the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. Um, and I'll explain this as, uh, in, with the following example. Let's say God wills something to come into existence. Let's call that something ABCD. This willing, as I showed you previous slides, happens in the sphere of Keter. But what the Radla, this unknowable head, does, it takes the will of God, the ABCD, and it scrambles it into every permutation and combination of ABCD, ABCD, CABD, BACD, and it sends the scrambled information down the nine lower sephirot until it reaches the final transducer, which is Malchut, the divine feminine which then gives birth or produces a product. When we observe the product, lo and behold, we see ABCD. This is very reminiscent of the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, whereby before you observe with your instrument or with your senses, there is a superposition of states whereby, in this example, all these states exist simultaneously in potentia, A, B, C, D, B, A, C, D. Only when you look, is there what we call a collapse of the wave function, where now we see one product, A, B, C, D. But, and this is crucial, here's where science, current science, it, it may change, I suspect it will, but here's where science and Kabbalah part ways completely. According to quantum mechanics, when we looked at the product, it could just as easily have been A, B, C, D, B, A, C, D, any of these combinations. In other words, when you look in the box, Schrodinger's cat could be either alive or dead with equal probability. But the Kabbalah does not see it this way. Because of this crucial axis that I alluded to in one of the earlier slides between Keter and Malchut, Keter imposes on Malchut to collapse the wave function to produce ABCD and only ABCD. This creates a very interesting paradox. The paradox is that from our point of view, we seem to be living in an indeterminate universe where there is stochastic processes and randomness such that um, the, when we observe, it could be any of the possibilities uh, listed here. And it just happened to be A, B, C, D. Were we to take God's perch, God's perspective, we would see, we would know that the final product can only be A, B, C, D. So is reality preordained or isn't it? Well, it isn't from our point of view because we operate below this Rudla membrane. And for all intents and purposes, things are indeterminate. But from God's point of view, operating from beyond the Rudla, everything is preordained. It's a paradox, but it's a paradox the Kabbalah is very, very comfortable with. Uh, it's an ontic as opposed to an epistemic type paradox. So to synthesize what I've said, the Kabbalistic formulation of consciousness is based on principles of Jewish mysticism, but in my opinion is best understood in the context of quantum mechanics, neuroscience, and, and contemporary philosophy. It's clearly panpsychist in nature, informed by the tenets of panentheism. It's hierarchically organized, it's holographic and relativistic, and contrary to the opinion of most scientists alive today, it is 
capable of downward causation. Kabbalistic panpsychism does away with Chalmers' hard problem, but so does all forms of panpsychism. What's more important is that it neutralizes the combination problem. Remember the problem of how do small mini consciousness, let's say in minerals, combine to form more complex consciousness in plants, animals, and man? How does that happen? That's the combination problem, but it's rendered moot by the fact that we're starting with an infinite consciousness, the conscious, the mind of God, which progressively reveals itself throughout the creation. So we don't have to ask how many consciousness combine to form larger consciousness. Large consciousness is there from the get-go. Because there's a transcendent phase of consciousness, according to the Kabbalah, this would intimate that there are non-local properties of consciousness that may be entangled with the transcendent aspects. And this may account for extrasensory perception, near-death experiences, prophecy, etc., which has been documented in virtually every culture. So in my last slides, uh, for those of you interested in this topic, I published a book called Kabbalistic Panpsychism in 2021, where I conflate ideas of uh, mainly uh, quantum uh, physics, Bohmian mechanics, with the Kabbalah, and I use these uh, concepts to try to uh, gain some understanding about artificial intelligence, female intuition, human neuroanatomy, some clinical situations we face uh, medically, uh, prophecy, free will, and I end the book by speculating on the future of consciousness. So thank you very much. Uh, I have some other slides which may be useful in answering a question, but perhaps I can now stop my share and turn uh, the podium <laughs> back to Ivy. Thank you. That was brilliant. <laughs> so, Professor, so you say the heart problem of consciousness can be solved, right? So how does this model reconcile consciousness as an intrinsic part of the universe with the subjectivity of individual conscious experience, though? Relatively easy to address because we're made uh, in Mago Dei. We're made in the image of God. And just like there is an imminent phase and a transcendent phase of the divinity. Similarly, we have an imminent phase of consciousness with, which is within the brain. Nobody denies that. As a neuroscientist, I would never deny that. But there is a transcendent phase of consciousness that is outside the brain. The imminent phase is yeah. kept separate from the transcendent. Why doesn't the transcendent phase inundate the imminent phase? And the answer is this Rudla membrane that I refer to. It is this unknowable head within the sphere of Keter that acts as what uh, what Carl Friston would call a Markov blanket, which is a which uh, is a um, a mathematical tool or instrument that allows a microcosm to be uh, kept separate from the embedding macrocosm, so that the uh, microcosm is not annihilated by the far more potent surround. And that's what the Rudla is doing. And it does it by scrambling the will of God. So we cannot directly intuit the mind of God. That's why it scrambles the, in my analogy, A, B, C, D, B, A, C, D. We don't really understand when we look at something why we see it. God understands why it's there because he put it there. But we cannot see it because we cannot intuit the will of God because of this Rudla. Unless, and there's an exception, and that's prophecy. A prophet is able to pierce this Rudla barrier and directly into it the will of God. We see it in prophecy, but it comes at a price. The price is the abrogation of free will, because as illustrated in many places in, in, in the Old and New Testament, when a prophet prophesies, he is basically just a loudspeaker for God's will. He has to push his consciousness completely to the side and just say what God is willing. And um, there are many examples of that, in, in, at least in the five books of Moses that I'm aware of. So that is the idea of a Markov blanket, um, which the Rudla acts as to try to uh, isolate uh, our mini consciousness from the much greater consciousness of the transcendent phase. 
Thank Bernardo you. Castro talks a great deal about this also. It is. It's and just you, a different, different wording. Yeah, you, yeah. you try to merge them together. So you got to understand a different word of it to, 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 well, to get them. Yeah, I got well, what yeah. I'm What I was trying to convey also in this talk uh, implicitly is that you can have the same concept, but different disciplines invoking different lexicons to make yes. the same point. Yes. And I said that what Bohm, David Bohm was writing about is not that different than what the Kabbalah was saying, uh, you know, 2,000, 3,000 years ago. Yes. So, Professor, how does the Kabbalistic construct the Sephirot, uh and reach our understanding of consciousness across different life domain, like inanimate, plants, animal and humans? Mm -hmm. Well, I, just like um, I try to to show you that the a given world, let's say the lowest world of Asiya, is really surrounding and encapsulating part of the world above it, and then that's called Yitzira, and that world encapsulates like that telescope metaphor that I showed you. Consciousness through the four domains of reality, I try to illustrate, is doing exactly the same thing. Whereas, um, uh, whereby a rock has consciousness because it's made of 10 sephirot, and the top three are conscious, because everything has top three. But when that mineral is part of a plant, you, the plant does now, no longer expresses the rock's consciousness because there's, because of what's called shvirata kelim, the shattering of the vessels, which I cannot go into unless you want me to, uh, in Lurianic Kabbalah, the bottom, when the world of Atsilut was made, the bottom seven sephirot shattered. There was a mismatch between the light and the vessel, and there was a shattering. And that's why bodies are made of many different parts, livers and spleens and hearts and whatnot. Whereas the top three, they were, there was a defect in them, at the, at, during this process of the shattering of the vessels, but they never shattered. So consciousness is always one to a customer. So even though the rock has consciousness of some sort when it's in a rock, the plant does not experience the rock's consciousness because it is now experiencing what its three sephirot are allowing to uh, transduce from the transcending compartment into the imminent compartment, which allows for a much higher level of consciousness which is growth and reproduction, which is denied to the rock. And the same thing keeps working up the hierarchy. So uh, an animal has all the characteristics of a plant when it comes to growth and reproduction, but it's not no longer part of the conscious aspect of the animal. It's buried within the lower seven unconscious sephirot because there's only one consciousness to a customer. And now the animal is expressing it's three, which is a much higher level, which completely obliterates any plant-like consciousness and now expresses itself as what, what an animal does. It's psychologically, uh, emotionally, behaviorally. And of course, a, a human being does it to a much greater extent, but nobody would deny that we have animalistic instincts, but they're compactified. Thank you. Professor, you've drawn parallel between Kabbalistic principle and theory like Heisenberg and certainty principle and Bowen mechanic in your work. Um, I just want you to delve deeper into how this theory from quantum physics relate to Kabbalistic concept, perhaps a real world example will make it clearer for audience. <laughs> well, asking somebody to give a deep quantum uh, <laughs> description in real world terms is almost an oxymoron, if you ask me. I know, but... In a classical universe. But let me say this. Um, it was said, and it still is said, that a person shouldn't learn Kabbalah until yeah. he's, he or she is 40, okay, number one. And they should be very well grounded in the uh, exoteric Torah, the, the Talmud before they embark on these more uh, uh, ethereal uh, studies. Why did they caution us against it? They cautioned us against it because there is a tendency for maybe we're not a good vessel for the light, to use a Kabbalistic metaphor, 
and there could be a shattering of the vessels. In other words, we may not be mature enough in our thinking to assimilate some of these highly arcane esoteric concepts. And there was a worry, and there have been cases where people have gone off the deep end trying to see the world through these eyes. Now that, I believe, is true, but is less true today because of the sciences, the same sciences that drew Christians and Jews away from their tradition, denying God, for example, uh, uh, looking at everything through materialistic eyes. The same sciences are now being the greatest defenders of Western monotheism, in my opinion. And I tried to give you examples of this, where today in the 20th century, you tell somebody in the street, he doesn't have to have a PhD, but you tell them, you know, your body is made up of invisible atoms. They're not going to bat an eyelash because people are used to the, uh, the physics of the 20th century telling us that there's a vast amount of reality going on that is, uh, is subliminal. You don't see it. So in other words, um, our minds have been fortunately uh, conditioned by these sciences, relativity, uh, quantum mechanics, Bohmian mechanics, to now be in a position where we can assimilate these Kabbalistic ideas without losing our balance. So this is why I spend time um, trying to give these, Kabbal these uh, physical uh, examples. And I think to answer your question more directly, the what this uh, a noble head is doing, scrambling God's message into permutations and combinations, to me is a striking uh, similarity to what's happening with the superposition of states according to the Copenhagen interpretation. And then so once you make an observation, you collapse a wave function. And that's when, uh, according to the Kabbalah, Malchut produces one product. It doesn't make all the products of living, dead, and intermediate Schrodinger cats. It doesn't. It either makes a living or a dead cat. And the Kabbalah agrees with that, except for the fact that the cat, whether it's alive or dead, according to physics, is random. And according to the Kabbalah, is preordained. Big difference. Yeah. So have to use the lexical adaptations then to combine, to merge that too, right, Professor? Yeah. Because you are advocating for that, right? Right. And, and you're right. I'm suggesting that this is more than just a metaphor. I'm suggesting radically, perhaps, that the Kabbalah is and the latest cutting edges of physics are really saying the same thing, but just using a different vocabulary, which is profound, I think, uh, amazing. I think that was a very profound um, comment there about the collapsing of the wave function um, through observation. And um, because it was very profound, I was just wondering if, you, if you'd like to unpack that by any chance, just a little bit, just to... Um, uh, give some people an understanding of the phenomenal experience of what that would be like. Phenomenal being in 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 the classical world. So this is the same uh, answer I gave to Ivy that it's uh, it's hard to to do a a, a Newtonian uh, type uh, analogy for quantum behavior, and for, that's. Just look at the Nobel Prize given last year, as I alluded to, for entanglement. There is nothing in the in the Newtonian world that uh, uh, anywhere uh, speaks towards the fact that in deeper realms everything is unified. The, you need to look at the Kabbalah for that, or Advaita Vedanta, or other Eastern uh, philosophies. Uh, some aspects of Buddhism. There, you will see perhaps this feeling that. In a deeper realm, things become more and more unified. But to give you a real-world example, uh, it's, it's very difficult to do so, uh, except to reiterate what has been uh, shown as uh, the, the most famous of all experiments in quantum mechanics is uh, Young's experiment of, the, of two, using the two slits, where he puts... Uh, the question is... is Light, light, the most sublime creation, light. Is it, uh, is it energy or is it 
particulate? Is it a particle or a wave? Uh, and that was raging in, in the scientific literature with different uh, physicists are, uh, you know, uh, backing one uh, outlook than, uh, as opposed to another. Uh, and then it was shown uh, uh, by Young in his experiment that when you don't observe the photons passing through the two slits, what you see on a screen where the photons hit the screen is a sort of a uh, diffraction pattern where uh, the photons are acting purely as waves. So you have like a sine wave, you have troughs and, and peaks, troughs and peaks, as if waves are uh, combining. And if you want a real world example of that, picture two people throwing, each one throwing a pebble into a pond and the pebble number one makes its concentric ripples and pebble number two makes its concentric ripples. And then you have interference between the rippling patterns uh, where in some places you have peaks, in some places they and the two uh, waves annihilate each other, so you get a trough. Um, that's how light behaves when you're not observing it. But when you look at the two slits and you're looking at the light passing through and how it hits the screen, the observation affects what is called collapse of the wave function. And now you see a bunch of dots behind slit one and a bunch of dots behind slit two. You completely lose the, um, the wave-like pattern. Uh, this is a shocking discovery. And it talks about something that I very briefly mentioned, and it's worth mentioning again, the difference between epistemic paradox and ontic paradox. And here, uh, uh, um, it's worth, uh, again, reiterating, that um, when you have a paradox, that the only reason it appears paradoxical is because we're just not smart enough to reconcile the two limbs of the, of the paradox, the two sides of the dialectic. That's an epistemic paradox where we, epistemology, which we just don't understand why things are the way they are. And the implication is that if we understood reality a little better, it would resolve the paradox and it would disappear. But what quantum mechanics and the Kabbalah are hinting at is ontic paradox, ontologic paradox. Not that paradox is a question of limited cognition, limited knowledge. It, ontic paradox implies that the paradox is part of the fabric of the creation itself. And no matter how smart you are, you will never reconcile the wave and the particle duality of light, because they're both equally true. And you just have to accept it. And the quantum uh, uh, mechanics field does accept it, even though they don't understand it. That famous saying that, uh, you know, when a grad student says he wants to understand the meaning of quantum mechanics, the famous line, forget who said it, is shut up and calculate. In other words, you, I don't think the human mind can resolve an ontic paradox. And the Kabbalah is filled with ontic paradox. For example, I mentioned one that free will both exists and doesn't exist. How? <laughs> it exists in a sense, we have a semblance of it down here in Olam Asiya, the world of Asiya, below this Rudla curtain. But if we could look beyond that curtain, we would see that the collapse of the wave function can only lead to ABCD and not any of the other permutations and combinations. Thank you. So that, that's as much as I could probably expound on this. Carl, you're happy with that? Does anyone have any questions jumped in? Or yeah, I'm very happy. I just wanted to bring up your very... Um, spot on when you brought up um just the different other traditions um and it's 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 definitely within tibetan buddhism as well so that was amazing thank you thank you kyle professor what are the ramifications of kabbalistic panpsychism for our comprehensions of artificial intelligence and the possibility of robotic consciousness in the future hmm. yeah so I do, 
I do have a subsection in my book dealing with this issue, uh, but in a very um, unique context. And the context is that of a human creation called the golem. Um, and based on a Talmudic and Kabbalistic understanding of the golem, one can possibly extrapolate to artificial intelligence in the following manner. <clears throat> I'll preface my remarks by first saying that the way the uh, Torah uh, legislature works is that we, for example, on the Sabbath are not allowed to turn lights on and off. We're not allowed to use electricity on the Sabbath, seventh day. Well, the rabbis from 2,500 years ago, they didn't have to deal with electricity. It didn't exist. But there is a law that you can't light a fire 2,500 years ago. So we can the rabbis extrapolate from that to electricity, and therefore we can't play with electricity. So I'm going to suggest the same thing with, with a golem consciousness. The golem has been uh, discussed in uh, homiletic Jewish literature throughout the ages as a humanoid that can be created out of usually clay, but sometimes wood and other materials, which looks somewhat human. It can be created if you know certain sort of mystical incantations that come from a, a book called the Sefer Yetzira, an ancient Kabbalistic text. And if you know how to do these incantations, you create this humanoid that has properties such as the ability to move, the ability to do work. It was created by certain people, uh, uh, as the legend goes, to protect Jewish communities in exile because they were strong. They couldn't speak. They were mute. And they even had the ability to sometimes disobey orders. So the question came up. Um, are they deserving of human rights? In other words, the Talmud, not even the Kabbalah, the, the exoteric Torah, Talmud has a uh, discussion on if you were to murder, if you were not, let me be careful with my wording, if you were to kill a golem, um, would you be guilty of murder? And after some debate, the conclusion was no. It isn't, it doesn't have a human soul. No matter how sophisticated it looks and how it moves and how it behaves, uh, to, to have a human soul that has to be endowed uh, by God himself, not by some incantation that someone said coming out of a mystical text. So the answer is no, it's not deserving of human rights. But then they don't stop there. They go on to describe some of the emotion-like characteristics of a golem which are very similar to and lead to the conclusion that we should perhaps look at it at the level, not medaber, which means speak or man, but maybe chai, which is animal. And there are very clear Jewish laws in place how to deal with animals to, to alleviate their suffering. Uh, it's called tsar balachayim. In Hebrew means how to alleviate the suffering of an animal. For example, uh, if you need to take the uh, uh, a typical example, the eggs of a mother bird, you should let the bird fly away first and not let her witness you taking the eggs. It's emotionally painful to the bird. So having said all this, based on the golem lore, I would say that if you can, and it's a big if, admittedly, if you can extrapolate from the golem to artificial intelligence, which is now showing up, everybody's concerned about, you know, chap, what is it? GPT and all this, whether it's becoming sentient or not. Some people are losing their jobs at Google because they're claiming that their computer is sentient. If you can extrapolate from the golem to AI, I would say that it will never reach the level of human sentience and will never, therefore, require uh, legislation to be put into place similar to human rights. But it should or could reach the level of uh, animal sentience. And then we sh all the laws that are in place in society for not harming your pet uh, or an animal uh, 
would be in place for uh, AI that shows that level of sentience. Thank you, Professor. Anyone have a follow-up before I move on? Briar Prakash? I wanted to say, you know, uh, thank you to the professor for taking the time. And a very interesting um, <clears throat> concept of that upper realm of consciousness and the lower realm of the manifestation. So now uh, if you bring it back into the human psyche, because you know, eventually we are dealing with the human psyche. You, you did mention Markov blanket and uh, the, the concept from Professor Friston's work. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm just wondering in terms of how you would uh, look at, uh, you know, because in other philosophies, you know, you have a philosophy where this whole thing that is manifested is just a reflection of consciousness. And so we are subsumed in that. And do you, uh, f- do you in Kabbalistic uh, logic, is the three domains which are, you know, pure consciousness, is that uh, a participatory role or is it a creative role? You know, that's my question. Is it a participatory or is it a kind of creative role? Well, to answer the end of your question to begin with, um, the, uh, as I mentioned, unlike reductionist thinking where consciousness is just an epiphenomenon, to, to many scientists, it doesn't even exist. According to the Kabbalah, the, the flow of divine energy starts from the top of the hierarchy, Keter. And Keter flows to Chochma, Chochma to Bina. These are the conscious sephirot. So consciousness is primordial to the bodily sephirot. So it's the opposite of the way the reductionist community uh, envisions consciousness. According to the Kabbalah, and I think according to several Eastern traditions, consciousness is primary. Consciousness drives everything else. The matter is contingent on consciousness more than consciousness is contingent on matter. But in contrast to pure idealism, as perhaps Bernardo Castro would, would suggest it to be, uh, and possibly in contrast to certain Eastern um, meditative traditions, um, we, or the Kabbalah, does not uh, view uh, the physical world as an illusion. It's not illusory. It's real because God wanted it to be real. He wanted to put us in a position where we exercise our semblance of free choice, where we agonize over ethical decisions because we believe that that is how we grow and and God put us in the world for that purpose. So it's not that that the Kabbalah is pure idealism. No, it's not pure idealism in the Kastrup sense. Uh, The physical world is very real. It's not an illusion. So... What goes on below this rudla, where we seem to exercise uh, free will in an in a indeterminate universe, it's real because God made it real for us. Even though there's a higher reality, a different reality, but it doesn't. The higher reality doesn't completely abrogate the lower reality. Is what I'm trying to say. They're both equally real, just like light. Is it more of a wave or is it more of a particle? No, it's not a question because there's this dual nature of light. You have to accept that they're both equally um, important. The reason why I ask whether it's uh, participatory or creative, is there an expression of that pure consciousness in all the other states? And if so, you know, because one of the things that a lot of the traditions entangle themselves with is the concept of birth and death. You know, um, uh, so... In that context, you know, how, where does Kabbalah stand with reference to that kind of traditional exercises people go through? Well, I think uh, the, the best way for me to try to address this is to look again at the Hitkalalut model, the inter-inclusion model. And that is, it's, when I gave this talk not that long ago to a different um, forum, a Galileo Commission, um, I was asked the question, if the Kabbalah is panpsychist, which means there's consciousness in everything, why is there not consciousness in the lower seven sephirot? There's consciousness in the upper three. Why not in the lower seven? And the answer is that, yes, it is true that due to the principle of Hitkalalut, interinclusion, as I mentioned, everything in creation has everything else in it. But the key here, as I try to answer to that questioner, 
is that just because a particle of the universe has the whole universe in it, it doesn't mean that the whole universe is being revealed. It's a question of revelation. 99% of what's in that particle is kept subliminal, hidden, and only what is being expressed is visible. So if you were to take the unconscious sephira, let's say of Netzach or Hod, one of the lower seven, we say it's unconscious, but if you were to unpack it, if you were to open it up and allow all the implicate order to, use, to switch the Bohmian terminology to come out, you would see pure consciousness. In fact, you'd see the, you'd see the consciousness of the Ein Sof, the divine absolute consciousness is in everything, but it's kept hidden. How could it be kept hidden? The answer is shown by that metaphor or analogy to a hologram. Uh, I showed you that if you take a hologram and you cut out uh, from the holographic plate a part of it, you don't, y y y y and you shine a light in it, you see the whole globe in my metaphor was a globe. You see the whole globe. But when you're looking at that piece of light in the holographic uh, plate or in the hologram itself, all you see in that part of the hologram is Siberia. But when you take out that part that contains Siberia, lo and behold, it has everything. Because now it's by taking it out, you're revealing it. But when it's in the hologram per se, the main hologram, you don't see every country being expressed within every other country. You see South America here and you see Siberia there. And do, you, do you follow what I'm trying to say? So consciousness pervades everything because everything is made of 10 sephirot, but it doesn't mean it's all being revealed. And it's revealed just a drop in a rock and a little more in a plant and more in an animal, more in humans. As we approach the seventh millennium, there's going to be, a, we're told, a major expansion of the uh, uh, or permeability of this Rudla membrane, where much more light, and of course I mean light with a capital L here, I don't mean physical light, I mean spiritual light, will uh, move from the transcendent component in a panentheistic uh, model into the imminent component. So we will become a lot smarter. And, it will, and the, the, what's nifty is that it will not just affect humanity. All of the creation Will, will all able, people become all, smarter? All people, but each to a different degree. Just like today, if you look around, not all people are equally intelligent. It's just a fact. And similarly, when the revelations become more prominent, certain, and in fact, uh, it's very interesting that an ancestor of mine who wrote a, a, a Kabbalistic text in the in the 1800s, he wrote when he was asked, when will the, because there's debate about it, when will the messianic era really begin? We know it's going to be within the next 220 years, but it could be tomorrow or it could be in 150 years. And they asked him, when will it be? Can you reveal the date? He says, he can't reveal the date because different souls will enter into the messianic era at different times, depending on their sensitivity. So it could be that there are some amongst us that are already perceiving the Messianic era. And some of us may have to wait a little longer, depending on your proclivities, your spiritual proclivities. So it's, it will affect not just mankind. You asked whether everybody will enter into it. Everybody will, for sure. But all of the creation will. Rocks will be entering into it because they're going to express more than they're expressing now through their top three sephirot. Until there's going, and this is only the, the, the seventh millennium where this whole process begins. Our tradition tells us it's going to be an, an eighth, ninth, and tenth millennium. And nobody can even imagine what is in store for us in the tenth millennium. The feeling is we'll be back, to, it'll be just one absolute orange of indivisible light of God, pure consciousness. And then what happens to the individual consciousness is up is up for debate. I do discuss a hypothesis 
you know, Professor, you were talking about how the the capital L light is going to transmit itself and create this awakening. Yeah. But in terms of the human psyche, if you look at the human psyche, that is aspiring. In all religious traditions, there's a spiritual aspiration. You're you're looking to an awakening, uh, a transformation. So uh-huh. within the Celtic uh, traditions, are there uh, things in the human psyche that one can engage with to open up oneself to those? If if it is already here, if the light is around us. The light is here. I believe that every major tradition, religious tradition, has its own formula for how to make this light apparent. In the case of Judaism, and I prefer not to speak for other traditions, but uh, in the case of Judaism, it's implementation of these 613 mitzvot that I mentioned, these deeds. What these deeds do uh, lighting Sabbath candles, and there's 613 of them, a lot. Um, what they do is they carve, if, if a person is made of light and vessel, forms the vessel into a shape that allows for the light to be manifest maximally. The problem, according to the Kabbalah in society, is twofold. You have situations where um, you have, a let's say, a person who has uh, tremendous uh, capabilities, either by their upbringing or their genetics, to be giant intellects, but for some sad reason, they never had the opportunity to get a good education, like during wartime, stuff like this. This is a mismatch where the vessel is extremely good, but there's no light, there's no ore light flowing into the vessel. Conversely, you can have the opposite situation where a person is biting off more than they can chew, their vessel isn't formed properly, and their attempt to incorporate huge flux of transcendent light is overwhelming. And they sort of go off the deep end, they have a psychotic break. Uh, In the Kabbalistic terms, that is what shvirata keli means, it's the shattering of the vessels. Uh, And that's also not ideal. The ideal situation is to be able to perfect or match your particular vessel to the light to maximize the uh, the, the combination of uh, ore and kli, or light and vessel. And the prescription of the Torah to do this are these mitzvot, are these commandments. Each one does its little bit of work trying to make you a better receptacle for the light of the Ein Sof, the light of the light of the infinite, and like I say, different religions have their own um, formulae for these. Perhaps in some of the uh, Eastern uh, traditions, uh, there's a larger emphasis on meditative practices, mindfulness type practices. And they do their good in bringing down light. No question. So, Professor, how does Kabbalistic uh, panpsychism interpret the relationship between truth and beauty, drawing upon the prophets of Mika proclamations, grand truth to Jacob? So how would you interpret this relationship, Professor? A question uh, that's so far not resolved, um, whether um, beauty, no matter how you define it, does it convey truth. Um, Interestingly, when Albert Einstein, to my understanding, when he first came up with the theory of relativity, he was asked by colleagues, uh, how do you know that your theory is true? I mean, there wasn't yet the uh, Michelson-Morley experiments and all all the the proof that have poured in for the last hundred years uh, supporting Einstein's relativity. But when he first came up with it, there wasn't these mathematical and uh, experimental proofs. So they asked him, how are you sure that it's real? So his answer was because he finds it so incredibly beautiful that it can't be false. That's what he said. And now I'm not saying I would say that. I'm not sure I could put that much uh, credence on beauty to convey truth, but the the passage that you cited in Micah, uh, which is in Hebrew, Titain Emet Liakov, give truth to Jacob, may address this question uh, in the following way. Three of our the forefathers of the Abrahamic tradition, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Abraham 
is um, linked in the Kabbalah to the sphera of chesed, which is loving kindness. Isaac, Yitzchak, Isaac, is linked to the next sphera, gvura, which is stern judgment. Jacob is the middle sephira, which balances chesed and gvura, uh, loving kindness and stern judgment in a balanced way. And it's called tiferet. That's the sphera that, is called, that Jacob represents as tiferet, which in Hebrew means beauty. So when you see Micah saying, give truth to beauty, it sets up an equation linking truth to beauty, which I think is mind-boggling. It doesn't say give truth to Abraham or give truth to Isaac, specifically Jacob, which represents beauty. So you propose that Kabbalistic Pensaiki provides a potential framework for integrating modern scientific discovery with immediate subjective experience. Could you elaborate on this integration? Could be achieved and its potential implications though. This view is a, a bit of a reaction against the materialistic view that tends to marginalize subjectivity. And uh, 95% of what makes a human being a human being are their subjective experiences. And it seems rather odd for this aspect of human reality to be ignored by science. I think a Kabbalistic perspective, which puts so much emphasis on the top three sephirot, um, and especially since there's a transcendent nature to one of them, the Keter, uh, I think it, it speaks volumes at an attempt to, instead of marginalizing subjectivity, uh, put it on a pedestal and show how vital it is to fulfilling ourselves as human beings. Well, I'm not saying it should contradict uh, the physical world. No, it should work hand in hand with the physical world, sort of like a, a dual aspect monism, where everything in existence has both a mindful pole uh, or a minded pole and a physical pole. And understanding that these are part and parcel of one thing I think is the first step in, in allowing us to um, exist in, um, in a much, much more unified, and I, I would say even ethical way, because chapter on this, small chapter on, that the Kabbalah um, does not look at human intellect as the pinnacle of human development. It links it more to ethics. Cosmology and ethics are inextricably linked in the Kabbalah, whereas they not, not necessarily so in science. I mean, I can cite you examples where uh, highly uh, uh, developed nations unleashed horrendous atrocities on humanity. I'm not, I can cite you examples throughout history. So the uh, development of the human being is contingent on far more than just intellect. Another way of expressing it is how my one of my teachers in Kabbalah, Rabbi Ephraim Goldstein, who lives in Safat in Israel, he says that there are 10 sefirot, so there are five axes that combine each two into a, in an axis. And science is very good at four of the five axes. They're very good at the axis between Chochmah and Bina, which gives rise to time, then the three axes, Chesed Vura, Tiferet Yisod, and Netzachod, three axes of space. And that's as far as science went. And according to this rabbi, science will never reach a, quote, theory of everything until it incorporates the final axis that I alluded to, which science hasn't gotten there yet, which is Keter Malchut, which is bringing transcendence and ethics into the scientific paradigm. And until you do that, there will never be a completeness. And this is incompleteness is hinted with the problems that physicists have with all these infinities that keep showing up in all of their math. They don't know what to do with the infinities. So they do a process called renormalization so that their math will make sense. But these infinities to me are a hint that there is something trying to creep into the equation, which is this final Keter Malchut axis, which will complete the picture. And then we will 
fulfill our real mission as human beings, not just intellectually, but morally and ethically and behaviorally. Yeah, it was a bit abstract for me to understand it. So that's why I try to unpack it again in a more easy way to understand by the audience. Reality does not stop at the material world. And you and science will never fully understand the nature of reality by uh, by exploring uh, materiality at um, greater and greater granularity. We will understand a great deal, and I'm not trying to belittle how much quantum mechanics and physics and biology and neuroscience has taught us. But um, the Kabbalah insists that this is only uh, touching on the seven lower sefirot, the bodily sefirot, and the mind and minded sefirot are being ignored by uh, contemporary science because they speak to the subjective side of humanity. And the subjective side of humanity is not easy to test. And anything that is not testable was deemed by the positivist movement as not objective and therefore not worth studying. But this is changing. And I think that part of the change is coming from the neuroscientists and the philosophers who are having a terrible time trying to, to fit consciousness into the picture. It just doesn't fit. No matter what you do, there remains David Chalmers' heart problem of consciousness. Hence, they're now starting to look at other models, of which panpsychism is one of. And idealism is perhaps a more radical uh, form uh, of um, trying to fit subjectivity into uh, the picture. But all I'm trying to say is that the Kabbalah was aware of the subjective nature of humanity from the very beginning. And this subjectivity is embodied in the uh, top three sefirot that imbue every decasephirotic system with, quote, consciousness, hence panpsychism. Thank you. And I also was able, the added value of this model, I think, over constitutive panpsychism is that it completely does away with the combination problem, as I think I already explained. Yeah, thank you. So if, let's say, I, I would take your model and compare to the Buddhism, Buddhism say form is emptiness and yeah. emptiness is form. Would you say your model almost the same, what you explained, as in we can't see as in one one individual, they're all combinations of actions of monism, dual aspect. You explain it that way. So I could see your model from my lens of view from Buddhism, which is form is emptiness and emptiness is form. So that is the dual aspect of it. But so are your model is non-dual completely, right? It's not compared to physical is it's quite different, is it not? Closest it would be, I think, uh, would be to dual aspect monism. Simply, simply because everything in existence, according to the Kabbalah, is made of just those 10 sefirot, of which the top three have to be mental and the bottom seven have to be bodily. So you can't separate them. Yeah. You can't just take three top ones and have an on a disembodied mind in that sense. Because none of it has its own independent existence, right? right? Right. So there it is. That is what Buddhism are saying as well. Yeah, is I think there is. My limited knowledge of Buddhism does suggest overlap between some of the Kabbalistic insights and some of the um, monistic uh, uh, Buddhist ideas. I think there are. I think... And correct me if I'm wrong, that, and I sort of alluded to it, that many form, some forms of Buddhism will look at the physical world as an illusion, if I'm not mistaken. Whereas the Kabbalah looks at, as I said, that the, the uh, physical world is as real as the spiritual world, because God decided he wants us to be in a physical world, and he wants what's called in Hebrew, he wants a residence down here, down below, in the in the physical physical world. He desires it. That's Keter Malchut. His initial desire was not the higher Sefirot. His initial desire, just like the woman who wanted, she didn't want architectural plans. She wanted a house. She wanted to live in a real house. But that was her first thought. 
And God's first thought, therefore, if you if you extrapolate to the deity, is he wants this physical world. So it's by no means an illusion. So I don't know, maybe I can ask you the question. Does Buddhism view the physical world as just an illusion? An illusion in the sense of that we have no separate independent self because it's empty of everything. Combinations of five skandhas, which is the sensory, the mental formations, uh, emotion, sensation, and all that. It's, it's considered the form of it. It doesn't mean that our, our physical form is an illusion. Yeah, yeah. So subtle, it's a subtle that. distinction. Mentally, we are still connected, interconnected, Any but anything out external of us is still effectus. Even though in our human level, how we're interpreting things, how we're seeing things, it does have condition and cause and effects, but it's not a deterministic way that how some model are. Yeah, in that sense, it's illusory because okay. there is no independent oneself, me, Ivy, independent right. of everybody. No, no right. such things. Yeah. So this is in a way of putting it in Bohmian terms, there is a, there's Ivy and Hyman Shipper as independent in the explicate order. But if we were to yeah. move into the implicate order, we might blur our margins in a sense. And the Kabbalah would agree with that as you move from one world into a higher and higher and higher world up to the top. Yes. Yes, that is what I'm seeing the correlate of the, there the, is, there is. Yeah. Yeah, I love the model. Professor is willing to engage in a slightly off tangent, you know, slightly <laughs> off tangent topic. <laughs> I really had, uh, you know, the, the Kabbalistic model. So if you, you know, I want to compare it with Vedanta, Eastern philosophy that summarizes uh, the the seeker's uh, aspiration towards that consciousness. Vedanta Advaita, it's called, I think. Advaita, yeah, Advaita. Advaita is one branch of Vedanta, but branch. Advaita, yeah. Uh, there are other branches of Vedanta, but Vedanta is uh, <clears throat> is an approach where all knowledge is done. The knowledge of the mind is complete. Now, from that point, what does the seeker do? Because they have reached a limit of perception with reference to the material reality, but they're conscious of all the things that they have uh, learned by engaging with that aspect of that reality. Not the world of things, but understanding how the mind itself is, to a certain extent, creating these. And once you get there, then I find that um, there are these three domains. One is the domain of the world. And it's basically called Akasha. Akasha means space. So one space is a space of the material world. Then there is the, that is called, it's in Sanskrit, it's called Bhuta Akasha or elements. The other one is called Chit Akasha. Chit means anything to do with mind, memory, thinking, all that. So that is another space. And the third is Chid, which is beyond these two, which is the domain of just consciousness. So, but in, in the term of aspirations amongst these different philosophies that come under that branch, one is Advaita, like you mentioned. In Advaita, the Chiddagasa is all-encompassing and the others are subsumed in it. But in some other philosophies, they are <clears throat> kind of dualistic. So the Chit, the thinking gives rise to the material and the consciousness. And then the, the thinking, the thinking are, itself... The thinking gives rise to the material I uh, get. Why does it give rise to the consciousness? Uh, isn't the consciousness give more primary to the thinking? Maybe I didn't yes. understand. So the, the, the way the aspirant works is as the aspirant becomes aware of one's own <clears throat> thoughts and the limits of thoughts, then they see that they transcend this and ah, yes, have you're moving experience. in that direction. Yes, you're moving from yeah, the less going in the other direction. to the more sublime. Yeah. I was going in the opposite direction. Okay, good. Yeah. But the, the, the third philosophy is like what you said about theism, that there is something that is creating all this. In terms of these philosophical archetypes, do you think there might have been a conversation amongst these thought leaders? Because there's a lot of parallels. Or is it that some kind of light of wisdom was shining in these places, which creates these different archetypes, but they have a lot of similarity. I just want to ask if you have thought about it or if you, if you think there is um, an avenue for investigation, because it looks like the, these domains of wisdom eventually transcends the common psyche of our expression through creating objects, object space. Yeah. In the way in the past, there might have been a joint conference or something where people <laughs> came up with these kind of philosophies. So I, I just wanted you to just uh, expound a little bit. If I, I'm not an expert in comparative theology, so um, I would definitely uh, limit my remarks. But 
when I gave a similar presentation to the Galileo Commission earlier in the year, uh, in February, a fellow whose name I don't remember, but I could find out, he asked me a sort of a similar question that based on some of the parallelisms that he perceives that I was enunciating regarding the Kabbalah were resonated profoundly with some of his knowledge of uh, some Buddhist uh, 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 understandings. And he said that he is a historian of comparative theology, and he claims that both the Kabbalah and some of these Eastern, other Eastern traditions stem from what he called pre-shamanic um, cultures that are more than 15,000 years old. Now, I, I, so if he is correct, it would address your question uh, as to where these things are all coming from, uh, if, if he's correct. But I'm in no position to opine whether that is correct or is not correct, or whether there's been uh, a to and fro exchange of, uh, of philosophies between cultures throughout the last several thousand years whereby uh, Judaism may have absorbed certain ideas from uh, uh, you know, Eastern philosophies and vice versa. I, I, this, I have no way of knowing whether that is the case. Between Christianity and Judaism, that's easy, because Judaism uh, is, was like a, the, the progenitor of Christianity. Christianity evolved out of Judaism, and to some extent, so did Islam. But there has been... I believe far less uh, uh, interaction, culturally speaking, between um, the uh, uh, between the mystical Jewish tradition and uh, Buddhism and Hinduism that I'm aware of, but I'm I'm limited by my own you know lack of awareness. Perhaps there has been uh, there have been communities. Jewish communities living in India since the destruction of the Second Temple, uh, since like 70 AD, there have been flourishing Jewish communities in India uh, because for some reason in that country, uh, Jews I know not, of one community. Yeah, yes, there, there are. There are the ones many, I come from, for yeah. the south of where I live, uh, a city called Kuchin. Kuchin, yes. Yes. yes, there's a huge community there. Yes. And they speak fluent Malayalam, but they also speak Hebrew. So because there was a relative lack of persecution of Jews in India compared to other parts of the world, Jewish um, culture did flourish. But what I don't know is how much cultural exchange was there? Was there like a very big Markov blanket between the Jews and the Hindus? Or was there... Um, more a fluid exchange of ideas. I'm not aware that there was, but I would be curious to learn if there were, <laughs> if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, the reason, the, the, the other reason I ask is, um, this is purely from a you know, material perspective. If you look at um, you know, the hominins, uh, we are the last, we are the only species in hominins as homo sapiens. And uh, we have a common ancestor with uh, the chimpanzee, the pan homo split. Every few hundred thousand years, there has been a new form of the bipedal man, right? So the early bipedal man was very similar to an ape, except that the back was getting a little bit more erect and the brain size was increasing. And then came inline toes, hips alignment, and the ability to move faster. But along with this, the, the brain size was increasing constantly. You can measure it by the skull size. Sure. So we went from 300 in apes to 600 in the Australopithecus, mm -hmm. and then to 1,200 in the Homo erectus. And then slowly we came to the you know what we have in Homo sapiens, which is about 1450. This is purely material. But what I've been trying to do is to study the archaeohistory and um, <clears throat> see if there's any connection between the domestication of fire and an interplay of living in the forest, because the forest must have been lighting up every now and then. 
to create forest fires. And one thing that uh, that one can envisage or that is very likely is uh, when the forests were, when the smoke, there was a lot of phytochemistry that is being inhaled. And at the same time, the new cognitive processes are evolving. And this is pre-homo sapiens, right? See where you're going. <laughs> yeah, my, my philosophy is that sometimes these fires might be the light. Uh, they might be the light that is needed to cause the physical change in the human and create this aspirations to f- expedite. It's not the medium per se, but it is an agent to expedite Mm-hmm. human conscious evolution. And <clears throat> by having that, they eventually the homo erectus domesticated fire. And then you see a lot of rituals in India and other places where they use fire and they put things in it to burn it. But <clears throat> what would have been the contrasting prior to situation was they were living amongst these communities of fires with different chemistries, some leading to pleasure, some leading to some kind of uh, neurotoxic mm-hmm. effects, some leading to <clears throat> some awakenings. And the glimpse was the gateway to the other consciousness. You know, that's uh, something that I always think about. So I thought I'll put that out there for you to. I, I, I find that model very compelling and yeah. <laughs> never heard it put in quite that way. <clears throat> but I do have a question about yeah. it. Plants, many of the most psychotropic agents that we know in neurology and psychiatry are derived from plants. Yes. And my question to you, uh, perhaps as a, a botanical uh, anthropologist, <laughs> if, if you will, why did the plants, uh, from a purely physical understanding, why did they develop such a, a plethora of remarkable psychotropic agents if they themselves really don't have a nervous system? I don't see what those compounds do for the plant, unless they may have some antioxidant properties useful, but but they're only manifest when when they're in animal brains. So why did the what was the evolutionary pressure for the plant to uh, invoke these psychotropic compounds? Yeah, that's a yeah that 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 there is a lot of interesting uh, <clears throat> facets to that part of how the plants evolve those pathways, and one of the simplest thing is uh, you can think about is externality. So if you take a leaf or the surface of a leaf, you have uh, these hair-like structures, right? And a lot of these aromatic or volatile compounds, which have these kind of effects, are sitting in those glands, so they're terminally pushed to these glands. So if you take cannabis, cannabis is the most studied in Canada, right? In Alberta, there's a faculty who looked at the evolution of that pathway. What you see is uh, when when the plants fix carbon and convert them to sugars, they have to shunt the sugars to either make new organs or store them. As some of the storage is uh, towards these cytotoxic compounds, prevents them being fed upon, right? So it, it's a kind of evading mechanism. So they store these compounds to prevent feeding so that they can keep growing. But they also store compounds for the animals to feed on, like you know, fruit and seed. You know, just to just so that they can spread their seeds. Yeah, just fruit is an evolution that, to spread the seeds. What fruit does. See, yeah. I can see that with fruit, but I'm having a, a little bit of a harder time understanding why the plant would want to uh, put an animal on a psychedelic journey. <laughs> if you see, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, personally, this is what I think. I think that when there is when there is an antip- anticipated movement of Imagine a scenario where they're not coming as one or two, they're coming in swarms, like a bunch of locusts coming to eat a plant. Producing a a cytotoxic compound which kind of numbs them is very effective, which allows them to survive over generations. And so you'll have a population with those cytotoxic compounds. Same thing with uh, these kind of, when the brain chemistry was changing with having these endocannabinoid receptors, then these compounds find a position in their evolutionary paradigm to remain within that and be part of their biochemistry. There's a complementation also going on. When, when the chemistry in the human brain has cannabinoid receptors, endocannabinoid receptors, and these compounds called anandamide, then you yeah. see that this, the, the retention of these compounds most likely was a way of kind of controlling animal behavior around them, right? Mm-hmm. Having a trip might make them <clears throat> more residently available around that space They'll hang out on that space, have a party, and eventually take the seeds or whatever they need to disseminate. So you, right yes, and sugar, it. sugar is the same. Sugar is also a, a drug for you know butterflies and moths and 
bees. Absolutely. When they get the sugar, it's like a drug. Yes, so they, they, it's a, it affects the behavior. We talk so about some that, sugar yeah. junkies. They're almost yeah, like they, a sugar junkie. Yeah, you can see the bees. Once in the, in the peak of flowering season, the bees don't move. They just literally sit on the flower and they just knocked off. They had one too many. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> <Wonderful>. sugar. <laughs> I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you, Professor, for engaging with that idea. Because <laughs> I find that very interesting that we are not very different from the, the, the immediate ancestors, but we have this phenomenal reach into consciousness. So thank you again. A wonderful session. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you so much. I very much enjoyed your questions. Thank, Thank you. you so much for joining us today. Um, everything that I got to listen to was incredibly profound. I understand that uh, faith is front and center, and a foundation in your life. And, it, and it's obviously made some connections that uh, very profound people have made. And then some intuitive um, for me, but um, I've never really had heard anybody at your uh, caliber or position, um, I, I guess, uh, gracefully express um, what you just expressed and what I was able to listen to. And um, it was amazingly beautiful. And um, I, I just, uh, it, it, it's a breath of fresh air um, because uh, after the whole atheism movement, I, I think um, we're actually society without being aware of it, um, are observing um, repercussions of that movement um, that they are not un that they are unhappy with, but they don't realize that it has uh, to do with a lack of faith. Um, yeah. And and so I just I think it's amazing and and to, that you're you've taken up the courage um, with your faith to um, transmit this um, wisdom. And uh, so thank you from the bottom of my heart. Well, I thank you very much for those those warm comments. And should you have any further questions or uh, interest in communication, send me emails and I'll try hard to respond if anything comes up. Uh, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Professor. Thank you so, so much. Um, and I look forward to interacting with you and your team in the future.